Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me for another episode of the Typical Skeptic Podcast. Welcome back to the channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, wherever you, if you're watching on Apple uh, Podcasts or Spotify or Amazon Music or YouTube or wherever, you know, make sure you follow me or whatever. And uh, the guest I have tonight is a returning guest. He's an amazing guy. He spent like, like almost 30 years investigating the paranormal. And who I have is with me. Uh, the guy from Space Out Radio calls him the crypto hunter. Uh Ron Murphy, and um, he's a paranormal investigator, a cryptozoologist, and an amazing author. He specializes in legends, folklore, myths, and the stories of vampires, werewolves, dogmen, lichens, haunted history, and the unexplained. And he seeks to uncover the archetypal president for the monsters that Connor Connor collected thoughts. And uh, I want to give him a big warm welcome to the show. Ron, thank you for coming back on. How are you? Hey, I'm very well, my friend. Thank you very much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, uh, what I wanted to ask you was, um, I think one of the audience to get familiar with you, you're from around the same area I'm from, like uh, a similar territory. Like I wanted to, you to talk about what it was like growing up in Pittsburgh and how you got into the paranormal. Like, Absolutely, yeah. So I grew up about 45 miles uh, east of Pittsburgh. Uh, no, yeah, east of Pittsburgh. I was just get, getting my, my coordinates there. Um, so anybody that's from this uh, particular area, because I know that you're right, you know, not too far from me at all. And anybody that's from around this area are, are kind of have the same type of upbringing, you know, very small town, middle America type of thing with the same type of values. Uh, but what I also find out is that people that are brought up in this general area also have the same type of culture whenever it comes to the paranormal, which I find very, very fascinating. Now, I was a child of the 70s, so, you know, I'm, I'm older than you are. Um, so what had happened in the 70s was uh, something very incredible in the world of the, the paranormal. Um, there was, um, you know, in 75, 77, uh, those two years showed uh, a, a marked difference uh, in climate change. Uh, there were times whenever the snows were so heavy. Um, I remember one time quite vividly, um, we were out of school for two weeks and uh, the mailman would not even deliver the mail. And that's one of the few times it's ever happened. So it was it was incredible, almost apocalyptic type of uh, uh, weather that we were experiencing. And, and something about that particular weather shift uh, seemed to stir up Bigfoot, whatever was going on, because shortly thereafter, uh, I grew up in a small town called Blairsville that really not much happened there at all. But shortly after these these winters, as as, as these snows were thawing uh, in the spring, um, a, a large hairy bipedal creature was seen in and around uh, my hometown and other hometowns uh, in Western Pennsylvania around the Chestnut Ridge area. Um, so as a, as a kid, you know, I'm fascinated by this. Um, and, and this was also a great time to be alive because we had things like In Search of On, and that's incredible. And all these great programs that were dealing with the paranormal and the cryptozoological. Um, and also um, at, at the time, uh, you know, I would listen to KDKA uh, out of Pittsburgh, uh, because once a month they would have the great Stan Gordon on there, and he would be talking about Bigfoot sightings and UFO sightings. So it was from this background that really led me to be the person I am today. So my brother and I and my mother, we would listen to these reports of Bigfoot sightings uh, very near my hometown, in and around the, the town surrounding me. And the next day she would take my brother and I out and we would go investigate these places to see if we could uh, come across anything or see anything. Now, of course, we didn't see anything, but it's that kind of kind of seed that was planted in me uh, that grew into fruition to who I am today. Yeah, I think Stan Gordon's like a, a also is a treasure too. Like I saw him at a UFO conference recently. He was here in Pittsburgh at the Butler UFO conference. I went to see Kathleen, Mar Kathleen Martin speak and stuff, but um, he's going to come back on the show in August. But I, I just think he's such a treasure to have because he kind of started it all. And what's interesting to me is that they, they put the UFO sightings and the Bigfoot sightings on the radio back then, but now they don't do anything like that. It seems like, well, it seems like the world's getting back into it. I I think we're going through a shift like um with the government going through disclosure i think that's bringing more interest to the um to the field of everything i think to the it's bringing more interest to ufos definitely but i think people it's just opening people's minds in general what, what yeah, do you I think, think i think that's a great point robert um back back in the day as you can say 
Um, people were hungry for this kind of stuff because pe things were being witnessed and there was no explanation for them. Um, nowadays, you know, you can turn on YouTube or whatever, and you can find people doing entire series on evidence that you can tell was photoshopped. But back in the time, there was an innocence to us, right? And like you had said, with all this idea of government disclosure, it seems that there's more there than it meets the eye, and people know things that probably the, the, the populace in general should know as well, too. But there's that secrecy there, and that secrecy is, I don't think it's ever good. I think that if there's something going on out there, it really does need to be exposed. Um, a lot of people have you said, you know, that, you know, the, the, the country would fall apart if people knew there was extraterrestrials out there. We would look at religion differently. Um, but, but I have to actually say that that is not the case. I think that if it was ever disclosed that there was extraterrestrials out there, it would actually define us more who we are as human beings. And I think that we would look at each, at each other as kind of these cosmic brothers in, 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 in a world that in a universe that might be full of life, and it might bring us all closer together as a human race, knowing that it's not just us out there, you know, that we have meaning, that we're part of this incredible chain of being out there. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I would really truly um, welcome any kind of uh, peaceful uh, uh, contact with an alien race. Do you think they're coming like extraterrestrially or do you think they're coming interdimensionally? Like I, I was thinking a lot more about the interdimensional hypothesis lately. And I think that that is something that has uh, a lot of merit, but like, it's, it's weird. When I was talking to somebody at my work, I was like, like, you know, I was like, I believe in the interdimensional. And he's like, well, what, where is the interdimensional? Cause we can't see, we can't ever see these other dimensions, but it's nice to think that they might be coming from them. But, it's like how we how do we can't access them but do you think that's like a valid that it, they could be coming interdimensionally I, I think that your point is more uh on on point uh for what's going on than the idea of space travel because space travel is something that we really cannot comprehend the distances that are involved i mean it would it would it would probably take a a a, a, a scientific um uh species you know tens of thousands of years uh, to reach our planet, you know, and in order to do that, they would have had to have some sort of idea that we were out here and we didn't start producing any kind of radio signals or TV signals until relatively recently. Yeah. Um, so it, the idea of just how far we have to travel is incredible. It boggles the mind unless there is a way that we can fall to time and space and create wormholes. I think the idea of interdimensionality makes tremendous sense um, because at that point, we're not looking outside of, of us. We're really looking at the world around us, which is very interesting. Now, the person that you worked with, I think that they have a very valid point as well to do. Where do they come from? So whenever I think about this kind of stuff, I look, like to look at other cultures, because if this is indeed happening, it does not exist in a vacuum. It had to happen before. Some people have had to have contact with these things before. And I look at the Australian culture. It was very interesting. Uh, it's very isolated. And because it was so isolated, it's relatively pristine. We don't see any other contact. We see a very um, insular type of belief system uh, that was not exposed uh, to, uh, you know, to the white person, to the Europeans uh, until, you know, the late 1700s. So we're dealing with a culture that's very old too. Uh, art, uh, their, their theology and cosmology is very ancient. And they have a, um, an entity uh, within their belief system, within their dream time system uh, that is called the Mimas. And this is a creature that exists in the space between spaces. So whenever somebody asks where this other dimension is, well, the other dimension is right here with us. You know, it, it's almost like if you take an onion and you peel it, um, each layer represents a different reality. And there's no reason. Well, I, I guess there is no reason now because science is postulating this and, and going about as far as validating that this is indeed the case, that there are realities, multiple realities, uh, working at the same time our reality is. So it's kind of like a, almost like a layered soundtrack with different, different uh, uh, instruments and everything layered up on top of each other. Now, it makes more sense to me that there is a civilization out there, there's an intelligence out there that can somehow 
open a door to get to our reality rather than having to, to bypass time and space uh, to get here. So I'm going to go with the idea of interdimensionality with you as well too. And then we would have to rename these little figures. So instead of calling them extraterrestrials, we can call them what John Keel called them, which is ultra terrestrials, things of this earth that are above our understanding. That that's pretty. So I like that. And but I wanted to get back to this uh, this entity that called the meme memus or whatever. I, I've never heard of it. It sounds so interesting. I know about the Australians and the what they have the gossamer glyphs where they supposedly have Pleiadian writing on one side of the wall and Egyptian on one side, and then supposedly one of the, there was two Egyptian brothers and one tried to steal this glyph with the Pleiadian writing on it, and a snake bit him. Did you ever hear this story? I, I did. Yes. You know, it, 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 I'm. These make great stories, okay? But a lot of times, whenever we really, and this happens in all cultures, this is just not the story, but it's the Egyptian culture. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not the Egyptian culture. It's the Australian culture. And you find this throughout North, North America as well, too, and in South America. So what um, people are saying, and I know that you did not postulate this, this is not your theory, but I think a lot of times whenever people bring up these kind of theories, what we're saying is, the Australian race was not capable of doing this on their own. And that becomes almost like a, a racist thing to me. And I always look at everybody for the capabilities. I mean, the, the North Americans were able to do fantastic things whenever it comes to charting the stars. And the Central and South Americans were able to do um, astronomical observations uh, as well as uh, the Euro their European and Oriental counterparts. So we as a human race are capable of extraordinary things. And I think that each race uh, developed separately and specifically to their own, their own needs. Now, the Australians definitely had uh, an idea of a cosmology, of, of a universe, and of a reality that kind of flowed together. And they had the idea of the dream time, which is this kind of um, straddling between worlds where you could go into another dimension. And that's also where we find the other uh, entity called the, the Wangina. Now, um, if you would compare this creature, uh, this entity in their cave art uh, to what people call you know, aliens nowadays, I think you'll be shocked at the similarities. Uh, these creatures have those very large bulbous eyes that you would uh, uh, associate with gray aliens. So it's very possible that you know, archaic societies like the Aboriginal Australians um, like the Egyptians, like North and South American uh, uh, Indian uh, nations. It's very possible that they knew about these dimensions simply because the world in which they lived in was so dependent upon the natural world around them, right? So there's a, a definitely a frequency there that, that you have to align yourself with this particular frequency of nature in order to survive. I mean, it was dependent upon their survival. The reason why they charted the stars is not because they look pretty. They needed to know whenever it was going to rain, when summer was coming in, when winter was coming in. So they, they were dependent upon the world around them. And if they were so dependent upon the world around them, is it possible, and I think it's quite probable, that they were able to identify things within this world that was coming and going. And I think these things come and go within our world as well, too. We just don't simply recognize them anymore. Uh, we have stepped out of the natural. We've stepped out of that natural cycle. You know, we've locked ourselves now behind closed doors and we've lit the, the night with electric light. So no longer we are in that rhythm anymore. We have established our own kind of frequency. Um, and that being said, it is going to be difficult for us to identify things that are part of the natural world simply because we don't take it into context. And the other thing is because we as uh, a human race do not like to accept things unless science has cataloged it and it needs to be down on a slab and it needs to be cut open and all that stuff. So really, it's, it, it's very possible that we will go on disbelieving these things that go bump in the night because they may never, they may never be categorized by science as we know it. Yeah. Do you think it's possible to even categorize like UFOs? Like I was thinking, but like maybe a lot of these are like uh, government UFOs, but at the same time, like 
they haven't had the technology. I mean, the people are saying that we've had it since the 40s, the technology that, you know, so I can kind of buy that. But I still think a lot of these craft are interdimensional. Like, it's so hard to tell, right? It's such a, it's so confusing. I mean, it's, I'm getting things from both people. I'm getting stuff from people who say it's government. I am getting stuff from people who say it's extraterrestrial. So I'm kind of like confused. I'm, you know oh, what I mean? I am too. Obviously, the government is involved in some way, obviously. Yeah. So, it, you know, whenever we talk, we talked a little bit about Stan Gordon and the uh, the, the crash at, uh, uh, at Kecksburg, you know, which is kind of like Pennsylvania's Roswell or even the Roswell incident, for that matter. Um, I think that it's possible that these crafts, whether they be interdimensional or extraterrestrial, or even if they are developed from another nation's, you know, science, that we kind of take them and we do that reverse engineering and make them our own. Um, I, I, I always tell my, my, my kids this, this is one of those great things if you think about this. Um, so you need me to believe uh, from a historical point of view and from a scientific point of view that we somehow mastered flight on, um, you know, on, on the sands of a North Carolina beach uh, at the turn of the 1900s, and our first flight was 300 feet, you know, less than 100 yards. And then we go on, and, you know, less than 100 years later, actually, you know, 68 years later, we are putting people on the moon. See, that doesn't jive with me. Something seems out of place. Something had to happen in there. There had to be that one kind of 2001, a space odyssey moment in there someplace because it, it happens so quickly. You know, we never see things like this happen before. And yeah. we're talking about heavier than air flight, you know? So I, I am a, a huge proponent and I'm not being conspiracy theorists. Neither are you, uh, Robert. And I like that idea about you as well, too. We're not delving into any kind of conspiracy. What we are saying is something needed to jumpstart our technology somewhere along the, the line. And I do truly believe that that technology was from elsewhere and whatever elsewhere, you know, you can kind of, fill in the blank there as needed. But I truly believe that this, this technology was from elsewhere, whether it was, you know, secret Soviet or German uh, technology, extraterrestrial technology, ultra terrestrial technology. But we as human beings simply, uh, I mean, that was a huge advance uh, to think about that, you know, I, and, and that's just one of, the, that one of the illustrations that I have. I never really thought about that, that it, it, it went so fast, because even if you look at like if you take UFOs out of the equation and you just look at like like I interviewed uh, what's his name? Um, oh, it's going to it's going to drive me nuts. Um, he he uh, it'll come to me in a second. But uh, he talks about the SR-71 Blackbird, you know, and uh, and, um, you know, it's uh, Jim Goodall. Jim Goodall is, his oh, yeah. name, you know, and uh, he he's talking about the TR three B. But if even if we take that out, so that's the triangle craft that we supposedly have. But yeah. even if we take that out, we got so far with just our regular jets, like our F fifteens, our F eighteens, and all that stuff. So I can see it may be possible, but I think there might have been an extraterrestrial intervention. Like they had to have given us some kind of technology, or we got reverse engineered craft, right? Sure. Like it sure. would seem like it have it would have to be like. It would be, yeah. I don't think it would be, I don't think we'd be able to master gravity that fast, right? I, I agree. That's my whole thing is just how quickly uh, it, it, it came about. You know, it, it was just so sudden. Um, so I think, and I think your point is pretty well, well, well said. I think there must have been some sort of mishap. Um, I don't think that we ever shot anything down, but there may have been a crash of some kind whenever we simply were able to go in there and re a reverse engineering to the point that we could make it commercial, you know, make it something that we could sell. We would use it, we would suck it dry of all of its military aspects. And then once that happened, then we could kind of turn it over to the consumerism that we are. And we could say, you know, not only would, can we kill our enemies with this, but we can get people from one side of this country in, you know, you know, eight hours rather than taking three or four days to drive across it. So we could kind of sell that as well too. But I'm truly, I truly believe that. Now, the other thing that we have to discuss as well too, 
uh, and this is part of that conspiracy realm. Do you think, or do we consider that the United States and other governments around the world may have had contact with uh, with advanced civilizations who kind of given gave their their uh, technology uh, and as part of this kind of secrecy uh, between you know leaders and between planets? Because that's something that's also stated. You know, a lot of people have said that there's uh, uh, extraterrestrials at work at Area 51, and you know there is this kind of like um, uh, cloaked government. Uh, in which, uh, you know, extraterrestrial forces uh, play a part. Now, I don't think that our government would allow uh, an extraterrestrial race to come here and abduct us and probe us. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this was written about by, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, oh, the planet guy. Who always said Billy, oh, Carl Sagan. Uh, this was actually written about by Carl Sagan um, shortly before his death. Uh, and he said that, uh, you know, an advanced race that is able to get to this planet would not have to, to probe people and abduct people in the middle of the night. What they would have to do is find one person, get a blood sample, and they would be able to extract all the DNA and all the knowledge they needed from about the human race from that one person. So, so you, I think... So, I'm sorry, I mean, I wanted to get... So do you think abductions were not, not happening? Because it seemed like there were like hundreds of thousands of them. Like, it seemed exactly. like something was happening. Like... Yeah. Right. So we have to discuss what was going on, because there's a lot of very lucid people out there that have been affected by the abduction phenomenon. Right. So something is going on now. Is it an extraterrestrial race? And if it is an extraterrestrial race, what is going on with that? That is the whole conundrum. That is actually the 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 the, the mystery question, because there, like, like I had said, and that is true. If you think about this, um, I uh, for 50 bucks. Uh, over Christmas time, um, I bought my daughter a DNA test where you spit into a little tube, you send it out, and you know five weeks later they send you back all this information where you can track your ancestry back, and it's quite accurate. I mean, it, it's finding cousins and everything else like that, so it's very accurate. And that was for fifty dollars that we sent away through the mail for. So you can imagine what a uh, an extraterrestrial race that's advanced enough. Uh, to come light years to where we live, uh, what they would be able to do, you know. Um, so we have to consider the technology and what they would be doing with us to, um, to uh, you know, why they need, would need to um, extract anything from us. Because as I said before, even we have the technology right now where we can uh, grow skin, you know, we can grow organs, you know, you, you, have you seen that famous uh, a picture of a mouse growing a human ear on its back? Um, we can splice DNA. We can do all kinds of things. We even uh, so cloned Dolly the sheep, right? We made Dolly yeah, the sheep. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that would be like, so an advanced race that would be able to come here, the cloning Dolly the sheep would probably be tantamount to something like buying a kid's you know, DNA kit at the dollar store or something. It would be kind of like on that line. So something else is going on here. Um, so the abduction phenomenon uh, See, so I like to talk about the idea of elementals as well, too. The idea of the Fey, the Fey world, the, the, the goblin universe, as it were. Um, and if we go back in time, and I'm talking about deep back in time, I'm talking about, you know, into the Middle Ages, um, we can see that people have been reporting being abducted by very small, strange looking creatures for a, a very long time. Now, that culture, because it was pre scientific, they said that they were fairies, um, that it was something, uh, you know, out of the natural world. Okay, so we don't like to use the word fairies nowadays. It seems a little archaic. So are we then talking about, again, the idea of interdimensional creatures, interdimensional entities? And I think that's what we're getting at. I think that it's not an extraterrestrial force that's abducting us. It is a, 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 a intra-dimensional force uh, that is abducting people. And... Um, Fairy abductions happened for a lot of different reasons in the Middle Ages. Sometimes it was to breeding purposes. Uh, sometimes it was just mere mischief, you know, mischievousness. Um, and uh, so it might be something where they're simply toying with us. They're doing it because they can. 
Yeah, and we talked, we got into fairies a little bit last time, but I, I yeah. wanted to cover it because it's so interesting. When I think of a typical fairy, fairy, I think of Tinkerbell. But yeah. what you told me is that they're much different. They can shape shift and basically appear in any way you want to see them. Like, and they're they're usually like tricksters. I guess my question is, what is the typical lore behind the fairies? But I mean, besides what you already got into, like, are they? I mean, like, and also, do you think the phenomena? has changed faces from fairies to gray aliens. Like, do you think it kind of shows us what it wants to show us? Like it can present itself in a way that we, it wants to, do you know what I'm trying to say? Like it, the, phenomena, the phenomena can change its face. Sure. So in, in the book that I wrote uh, called uh, the, uh, the Unexplained World of the Chestnut Ridge, I delve into this idea about fairies and the way they can um, uh, uh, look, you know, they somehow can interact within our mind. So there was something called uh, the Dacasian theater of the mind. And this is a bit of a theory where the mind it really does make up our reality, but also the mind can be manipulated in a lot of different ways, right? I and mean, we, we, we do it all the time. There are psychedelic drugs that we can take. There are psychosocial drugs that we can take that are medically prescribed. Uh, alcohol can do it. But not only that, my friend, but also the idea of sound, infrasound, can also manipulate the way that we think. So we have all these different ways that we can make a person think differently uh, than they, or, or think less clearly, or see things that aren't there. And if it's possible that there is a, a entity or a species out there that's capable of doing that, then that can explain a lot of things. So the idea of shape shifting doesn't necessarily mean they have to physically shape shift, as long as they implant in the mind that what we are seeing is happening, that becomes our reality at that point. So if something is there, and say that it's just made out of an intelligent light, say that it's just an intelligent electricity that exists in this world that we know it, yet it's able to implant a thought in our mind that that little you know, maybe pinpoint of light that has an intelligence to it can become a 12 foot hair covered bipedal creature that we call Bigfoot or turn into a large bird and become a Thunderbird. All these kind of things then make sense to me because I am not of the belief that in a place like the Chestnut Ridge where we see black cats and Thunderbirds and Bigfoot creatures and um, also hauntings and dogmen and werewolves and all this stuff. I'm more of the mind to think that there is something out there impacting the way we think and the way we see things, rather than there is all these kind of apex predators out there stumbling over each other in a very narrow strip of land. Wait, I wanted to. I definitely wanted to get into the Chestnut Ridge because I think that's really interesting. You wrote a book on the Chestnut Ridge, and I think all my listeners should go out and get your book on the Chestnut Ridge yeah. because it's a really interesting. Like, I mean, I know that um, Stan Gordon had told me about Fayette County. He said Fayette County is really active, but the Chestnut Ridge puts that to like shame, right? Or like the Chestnut Ridge is really active, right? Can yeah. you get into where the Chestnut Ridge is and what? It's yeah. like there as far as yeah. like sightings go and stuff. And, and that's a great point. But the, the, the interesting thing is uh, the, the Chestnut Ridge goes right through Fayette County. So, oh, it's, it's, so it's in Fayette. It's part of oh, Fayette County. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So it's Fayette, Westmoreland, Indiana County. And then it terminates right outside of Morgantown, West Virginia. And for, roughly, for, the, for the people that don't know that aren't from Pennsylvania, these are all places in Western Pennsylvania yep, that are in exactly. the Western side of Pennsylvania, where like, you know, Philadelphia is on the East. This is on the right. Western, like near Pittsburgh, where we, me and Ron. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So right, just, right. I just wanted to let people know that. And it runs yeah. right into West Virginia, you're saying, right? That's right. And it's part of the Appalachian Plateau, which is interesting because um, where we find Point Pleasant with the Mothman, that's also part of the Appalachian Plateau. So it's all ge geologically the same that we're talking about here, which makes it even more intriguing. Um, but I, the other thing I want to touch too, Robert, and you just mentioned uh, uh, Fayette County, uh, the word Fayette actually means little fairy. And if you wow. look around the country, um, oftentimes very sinister things happen in places that have the name Fayette attached to them. Uh, for instance, I believe that it was in North Carolina. I believe it was in North Carolina. Uh, there was a small town um, in, in Fayette, of all places, uh, where there was a, a number of murders. Uh, so it seems like the, the word Fayette, now, now I have suggested that Fayette is not just a, simply a pretty name, but it's also a warning, almost like 
you know, here be dragons type of thing. So if you go into an area that is a little out of the usual, it's very possible they said, you know, we'll call this Fayette because there has to be fairies abroad. Um, that's really my opinion of this. But I think that that we have been experiencing these things. We know the Native Americans have been experiencing these kind of things since before we came. So we know that it's not um, the white man, the colonists introducing this. We know that there was something strange here for hundreds of years before we arrived. It's still going on and nobody has come up with an obvious explanation for what is going on. Yeah, it's amazing. Like, and and back to the Chestnut Ridge. Like, uh, how wild does it get there? I mean, like, what 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 goes on? Like, I mean, like, what, uh, is it everything? Like Bigfoot, Dogman, Thunderbirds? Like, what, yes. what's it? So, in my research, um, my thirty years of research has almost been exclusively on the Chestnut Ridge. At least the ongoing research that I've I've, I've had going on. Um, it's a very interesting place. Um, it is uh, littered with boulders. Although the um, the uh, uh, glacial shelf did not come down this far, so all the boulders and everything is from this upheaval. It was whenever uh, plates were pushing together, um, and at one time this area was actually the tallest mountain range in the world, and it gradually started to to, to rip down. So at one time we were bigger uh, than the Himalayas, um, but it's an it's a very ancient uh, 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 mountain system. Um, it's littered right now with caves and coal mines and all the towns around it. And I'm not being a melodramatic. I mean, all the towns around it have some sort of story involving a haunting or a creature or something that goes bump in the night. I do tours right now in, in my hometown of Blairsville, uh, but also I, I do them in other places all around the Chestnut Ridge simply because there's such a wealth of stories. But yeah, absolutely. I've researched Bigfoot up in that area. And um, I've come across uh, on uh, a few different occasions, a very small track. So not these humongous tracks that you would expect from a Bigfoot, uh, but very small tracks, almost from, and not even a juvenile, I'm talking about a very small track of something. And I've discussed this with Stan Gordon at length. And he said for about 30 years, there have been reports of very small um, size tracks of some, something bipedal up there. Um, so there's something strange going up there in the realm of, you know, even Bigfoot. Um, I've interviewed people that have seen uh, a, what, what they said was a dog on two legs uh, staring at them from the woods by their uh, by their blacktop driveway as they put groceries away in the house. Um, I've talked to people that have seen a black panther uh, drinking out of their pool in their backyard. Oh my I've, God, that's uh, amazing. Know, exactly, exactly. Uh, people that have witnessed uh, birds with 22 foot uh, wingspans. Um, so there's something going on up here and it all revolves around the Chestnut Ridge. And now we have to think about what is on the Chestnut Ridge. We know that there's a lot of sources of water up there. We know and also that there's a lot of limestone up there as well too. And it seems sometimes that this geological nature uh, is almost like an energy uh, port in and of itself. Uh, if you think about the famous Barney and Betty Hill uh, case that happened in New Hampshire, um, that area is very rich in granite and limestone. So it seems there's some sort of similarity there too about the kind of batteries that are used, these natural batteries that are used to energize these certain manifestations. So yeah, I think as, as researchers go, we have to investigate much deeper than just the, the sighting or the uh, alleged encounter we have to kind of go deeper and find out exactly what's going on in the area as well, because the area itself might be the reason for these encounters. Yeah. So do you think it's something with like electromagnetism or um, what, you know, I, I guess that's an easy way. I, Cause I don't really even understand electromagnetism. I just have heard of, I'm kind of reiterating what I've heard, you know, and I'm right. trying to think right. of ideas like a, what would cause like, a black panther to show up and start drinking it's like for people that don't know what black panthers definitely are not common in western pennsylvania i don't think they're common at all right they're like no the, no 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 they're, no they're more mythic type creature right absolutely yeah there should be there should be zero panthers in pennsylvania even though mountain lions did exist in pennsylvania up until the 1920s uh, but there should be no panthers going on in Pennsylvania, especially a black panther. So this seems something that is not cryptozoological, uh, but almost supernatural in nature because they simply shouldn't be here. 
Yeah, and a bird with a 22 foot wingspan. That's a insane. Right? Like, you know, I wanted to ask you what you thought of this. This is, I, I brought this up in another podcast, and it honestly, this gave me goosebumps because, like, I live, you know, like towards, like, well, I don't want to say on, I did, you know, where I live, but yeah, I, right, I, right. it's kind of like a wooded area. But, like, so I was walking down my hill the other day. I go for exercise. I was walking towards the store. I went to get, you know, it's whatever. And, uh, I was going down the hill and I was halfway down the hill. And like I said, there's woods on both sides of me, but it's a road. And there was two enormous birds. They, I, they had to be vultures eating some kind of roadkill. Now, what was weird about it was it almost looked paranormal in a sense because these birds were so out of place. But I know they're probably part of the natural ecosystem but not maybe here in Pennsylvania. I've never seen vultures here my entire life. So let yeah. me ask you this. Do you think this is something superstitious that maybe I should think like, have you ever heard of someone seeing vultures and then something happened in their life? Or do you think it's something a little bit more supernatural? Or do you think it's just a part of the natural ecosystem of here? In I, and I'm glad that you brought this up now, Robert, because we are now delving into the idea of misidentification. And this happens all the time. I remember the first time as, as, as a researcher uh, encountering <laughs> a, a, uh, a vulture. Now, there's two different types of vultures in Pennsylvania. We have the turkey vulture and we have the black vulture as well, too. I remember I was, I was on an investigation, as a matter of fact, and I was going down this backcountry road. And a, there was some sort of roadkill on the road. And there in the middle of the road was a turkey vulture with its wings full spread, like you would see on like the animal plan or something happening. They look scary, right? They oh, almost, oh, you're just, I had to turn around and walk away. Like I was honestly scared shitless. Oh, you know, and like, that's what they're designed for. You know, they're designed to keep other animals away from their, their, their eat one another they're eating, you know? So they're, they're massive, massive birds, but that wingspan and the way their, their feathers are spaced out, you know, the, the, the feathers almost look like fingers reaching out for you, you know. Um, so I saw this and um, luckily the bird did not fly away. So I was able to, to look at it for a little bit. Um, most of our roads uh, around the country um, are about 11 to 16 foot uh, uh, wide. OK, um, now where we were at here uh, and this was in the, in the back roads of Westmoreland County. Um, so there was a lot of like vegetation and overgrowth on both sides of the embankment, right? So we have the road going down and on both sides, we have like bushes and trees and everything growing over. That's kind of and like that, the same situation as I was in. That's exactly the yeah. way you described it. That was how exactly how mine was too. Right. So with the vulture with, his, with its uh, wings opened up, it looked as if it spread completely across the road, right? Because there was vegetation, and everything growing up. So now in my mind, I can say, well, that vulture opened up its, up its wings and you know, its wingspan was the entirety of the road. Even though I wasn't accounting for on each side of the road, there was probably about three or four feet of overgrowth. Regardless, the wingspan on these creatures are still massively large, you know, you know not taking anything away from them. But could you imagine if you're somebody from the city and you do not have a working knowledge of this, nor do you even know that these kind of creatures exist in Pennsylvania. Because whenever I saw them, it looked like I was something off the African savanna. And, you know, immediately their mind goes to the, the supernatural or it goes to the idea that I saw something that shouldn't be there. Um, there's a lot of Thunderbirds that are um, witnessed in uh, Greensburg, Pennsylvania. And there was one just recently. Um, it's off of uh, 119, uh, and whenever you go on to uh, 119 on to, uh, Route 70. Um, but um, I did an investigation down there. Now, this is an area where there is a Burger King, there's a McDonald's, there's a hotel. But right across the road, um, there is up on the hill, there is a, uh, a housing uh, complex uh, that was built very recently. But on the one side of the road, right across from the Burger King, there's a small patch of woods. And I'm not talking about a big patch of woods, not like an acre or anything like that. Maybe, I don't know, maybe a, a couple hundred square feet, just very, very small. Um, and I decided that I would go investigate this because this is the only wooded area uh, in around this area. So if there was a thunderbird here, this is probably the place that would have to roost or whatever. You know, I went in there and almost immediately whenever I went in there, 
I scared up a flock of turkeys, a sizable flock of turkeys. So again, like I said, misidentification, people seeing turkeys, and they, they can fly. They have very, very large wingspans as well. And people seeing this immediately jump to the conclusion that they're seeing something because they simply do not know what it is. So I think a lot of this goes into uh, into to account. And um, the other uh, creature that is being seen too, uh, oftentimes is described as a pterodactyl type of creature, uh, something reptilian. And um, I, I do a lot of research uh, into uh, the, these kind of flying um, cryptozoological creatures. And uh, almost all instances that I've come across with people experiencing these flying reptiles, I've been able to, um, to uh, figure out that it was a, a large blue heron uh, that was responsible. Um, they have a, a terrible, terrible uh, uh, call. It's nothing like a, uh, you know, a songbird or anything. It's very guttural um, and it's, it's, it's sort of alarming whenever you hear it. Um, it has a very long neck and I, because it's a, it's a, it's a wading bird uh, that uh, picks off its prey by, you know, wading and, and picking them up. It has a very large beak that seems to be almost like an elongated snout that you would see on a pterosaur. And also they have very long legs that they, 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 they drag behind them uh, whenever they fly. So it looks almost like you have a tail uh, there that's kind of like a rat's type of tail. And they have a very large wingspan as well too. Uh, again, if you're not used to seeing these things, uh, it appears to be a creature out of, you know, out of nightmares. Um, also, I need to say that in, in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, uh, there are a lot of osprey around here as well, too. And what are I was osprey? Um, they're they're, they're a, um, uh, a bird of prey, um, sort of reminiscent of a, uh, of a, a falcon, uh, but much larger. Um, you'll see them a lot at uh, state parks or any body of water. And they'll kind of like hover over the water and then they'll dive in and, and usually they get a fish. They're, they're very accurate. Um, but um, the other bird that is also making a comeback, and I was recently on a Bigfoot uh, investigation and my son and I had spooked one of these up and that was a bald eagle. Uh, and, and you don't expect that to happen, uh, but we were in some very, very deep cover and apparently it was parts very low to the ground. But whenever that thing took off, it made such a racket getting up there because we're trying to account for, you know, a seven foot wingspan uh, to get out of a very enclosed space. Um, so it was very frightening, but it was that, you know, that flash of white on its tail. And then uh, that, that, of course, the, uh, the evocative head uh, that it has as well. So I'm glad that you brought that up, Robert, because I think a lot of things that people are seeing out there, especially whenever it comes to avian cryptids, are misidentified birds. But do, do you think the, 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 the cryptid bird exists, though, the, 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 the thunderbird? I'm sorry. Yeah, well, then we have to, so was there such a thing uh, called the Thunderbird? So as a researcher, that's what I like to look at. And, and, and yes, uh, in the Pleistocene era, uh, there was something out there uh, called the Argentavis Magnificence, which was a huge bird, uh, you know, maybe a 20 foot wingspan. Um, so we know that that bird is out there, uh, but conventional science says that it died maybe 3 million years ago. But that's not to say that there was not a remnant population existing up until the time human beings were around, because we are Pleistocene animals as well, too. And we've only been around for about 200,000 years. So is it possible that, that, that a group of these birds lasted? Well, of course it is, because we still have the California condor out there holding on. So just because the fossil record says that it died at a certain time does not mean that the entire species died out. So I think that early man... Um, would see these creatures and the reason why they equated them with thunderbirds is because they were so large they relied on thermal updrafts to keep them aloft you know we're talking about a huge a huge bird um actually it was so huge that if it existed now it would be show, it would be caught on radar uh for planes it would be that huge of a bird oh my so, god yeah it's huge so it would rely on these thermal updrafts so as ancient people if we would see one of these birds, that would be an omen of incoming storms because we know that there's a front coming through that will allow these birds to stay aloft. So I do believe that a lot of indigenous legends uh, from uh, Native Americans do point to the witnessing of at least a remnant population of, of these, of these uh, Argentavis magnificence up until 
at least we were able to enter them into our oral tradition. Uh, you know, they may have died out very soon afterwards, but something in our collective unconscious as human beings remember these birds being alive. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. And I wanted to see if uh, yeah, I wanted to go in the direction now of uh, my last once my last question for you is like about dog man. Um, you wrote a book on dog man as well. And I wanted to ask you what what area you researched for the dog man cases like or your dog man book like um, and were people coming to you with stories of uh, interactions with them and stuff like that or absolutely. Yep. Again, Chestnut Ridge area, almost the majority of my book uh, of my research is, is based in this area. I would have people come up to me and say, you know, I'm a werewolf. I remember this happening. There was a young man one time and he said that he was a werewolf and I accompanied him out in the woods while he said that he was going to transform for me. Now, you know, it's a little, it's a little frightening uh, to think that someone's going to transform, but we went out into the woods um, and he um, claimed that he did transform. Now, in his mind, he may have, uh, but physically nothing happened. But I remember, you know, quite vividly because, you know, you get a little afraid whenever you're out there in the middle of nowhere and somebody's saying they're going to change into a werewolf. Um, but he took on the mannerisms of, 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 of a dog more than a wolf. Uh, but, you know, he would go down on all fours. Uh, he would run quite well on all fours as well, too. And then whenever he would take a rest, um, he would uh, walk around in circles and kind of like make a little a little bed for himself there in the dirt. So watching this and experiencing this for the over the course of a couple of hours was more like a sociological experiment uh, or a psychological uh, intake uh, more than a cryptozoological or paranormal uh, investigation. Uh, but there are people out there that identify themselves so much with with werewolves and the romance of that that they have kind of believed that that's what, what, what they do. Uh, but there's also other tales that are much more frightening about people that claim that they go out in the middle of nowhere and, um, and transform because they don't want to hurt anyone. And those kind of, those kind of stories that I hear uh, seem much more plausible than the, than, than the other one. What about the ones of the, the dog man? Like, do you get stories of like people just running into dog man? Like, uh, on a like you know like like how, like the type of stories you hear like um I don't know if you listen to, if you ever heard Dark Waters Dark Waters he has dogman cams up all over he supposedly put them up all over where he knew like spots where dogmen were like did you have people with regular encounters of dogman as well like people that like just saw him in their on their back porch or like a werewolf type is that happened too absolutely yeah and one of the scariest things is whenever uh, and this happens very very rarely. But occasionally a game warden will come up to you off the record and tell you. Now, this one particular thing, and I know that we're, I'll, I'll try to make this brief, but uh, they were in a, a particular area where they were investigating. Uh, nothing, whoops, hold on one second. Nothing regarding the dog man or anything, but they were investigating uh, a particular area. And they remember getting out of their Jeep and they had a feeling that there was something watching them. And they said in the, in the woods, they could see an upright creature that resembled a, a, an upright wolf watching them. And it kept on watching them until they got back into the Jeep and left. And this was from a game warden. So unless he was trying to you know, pull the wool over my eyes, um, he, he did a good job of it. He seemed very lucid and he seemed very uh, confessional whenever he was telling the story. It didn't seem like he had anything to gain from it uh, to, to make fun of me or anything. But uh, those are the kind of stories that keep me going. And of course, look, Regular people, uh, Ligonera area, again, uh, a lot of sightings there. Uh, but sometimes the sightings will, will become that they see something outside of their house that resembles a dog man, and then they hear their, their name being called. That's some scary stuff. Or, or something tries their doorknob. These are things that really kind of um, indicate that there's a dog man around. Because one of the reasons why we call them a dog man is not because they are, are in the shape of that anthropomorphic shape of a person, but they also have an intelligence that none of these other cryptids have, where they can mimic sounds, they can mimic voices, they can try doorknobs, and they try to problem solve to get at you. Wow. They, they, they try to problem solve? Yes. Yes. What do yeah, you mean? Oh, oh, they're trying to get in the door. You yes. Mean? Yes. Or to lure you out by calling your name. 
Wow. So they have like a supernatural aspect as well. Right. Absolutely. Yep. That's Absolutely. amazing. I've never, I, I didn't know that about them. Like they're really like, uh, I mean, I've, I listened to that show called Dogman encounters and like, I've heard some really weird stories on there, but I, I didn't know that they had the voice too. That, so they're really like a devious creature, right? They are a devious creature. That's right. So yeah, that's the, the what led me to write about, uh, the dog man, uh, initially, uh, was the idea that all cultures around the world, again, like I said at the very onset of our show, you know, they don't exist in a vacuum. So if they were, if we have them now, we obviously had to have them have them in our past as well too. I'm sorry about that. My phone keeps going off. We all, almost had to have them in our past as well too. So I look at the historical significance of these things. Do we have them in our past? And we know in Egypt we had the uh, Anubis, who was the the, the, the quintessential dog man. But also our Native American cultures as well have uh, have images of dogmen. Now, I will be speaking at um, the Werewolf Conference uh, outside of uh, Nashville, Tennessee, um, the middle of next month. So if any of your listeners uh, would, would want to make a vacation of it, I would urge you to come on down. Uh, and the topic that I'm going to be covering is um, the, uh, the werewolf archetype in the mound building cultures of Pennsylvania, Ohio, and uh, Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, there was a culture there uh, in this Ohio Valley area um, that seemed to be part of a wolf cult um, to the point that whenever they would bury their, their dead shaman, their leader, what have you, um, they would take a wolf skull and they would actually take the bones apart of their of the of their, the, the the person and manipulate it in such a way like remove the lower jaw so the wolf jaw could then go over so at the end of the burial you would have a a human being that also had the parts of a wolf attached to it as well too and then they would cover it in fur so if you would if you would look at it you would say that this person this person was a werewolf that they were burying. So what was the reason why they did this kind of stuff? You know, was it imitative magic by something they, they had seen in the natural environment? Or was it sympathetic magic? Or was it a way to provide uh, the dead a way, a passage to the afterlife? And if that is the case, what in the heck is uh, a mound building uh, indigenous population in North America having such in common with an Egyptian, you know, with, with, with an Egyptian culture that also saw the dog man as a spiritual conveyor of the dead. Wow, that's amazing. I just yeah. wanted to tell you real quick, too, if you go down to Tennessee, there's a guy I interviewed down there. He's a he's an abduct. Well, he's he wrote a book. He's an author, but he's a he's a abduct. His name's Sandy Nichols, too. He was on Coast to Coast AM. OK, he, he has a an Aztec burial site in his backyard. Like wow. somehow it's insane. I don't know. It's it's insane. Yeah. But um, yeah, we'll have, to, we'll have to talk about that sometime. It, it's not in the cryptid realm, uh, but it's definitely because I do. I, I studied the uh, Native American cultures uh, in graduate school, and it's, it's really one of my my. Uh, uh, I, I really enjoy talking about them. But yeah, we'll have to talk talk about the idea of these these uh, Mesoamerican cultures that quite probably did expand up into uh, North America. That's what I was getting at. It seems like they 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 were they were up here, and it was like. I, and like I, I just had the guy from America Stonehenge on my show, and it seems like that that like the the world, the ancient world, was much more connected, right? It seems like maybe you know like there were people here from other places a, a long time before we 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 thought there were. You know, I yeah. don't think it was just Columbus and that. No. And that like I think there was a lot going on before that. But I just want to ask you one more question. And I, sure, I'm sorry. sure. The, the last thing I've been asking is, do you, what are your thoughts on the spirit world? Like, are you pretty sure that consciousness continues after death from your studies? And what, what do you think? Like, yeah. So, you know, as part of my faith, you know, I'm a practicing Catholic and I do firmly believe in the idea of the soul or an afterlife. Um, and I think that as a paranormal investigator, very few people who have been in this field for, for more than a while, you know, more than a, a, a few moments will say, out of all things paranormal, the idea that the soul goes on after death is the one that makes the most sense to any of us. I mean, I don't think there's anybody out there that can, can say, oh, you know what? I don't believe in ghosts because ghosts are part, again, a part of every culture around the world. Um, and they, they all are the same format. Uh, whether you're a religious culture that, that specializes in the Judeo-Christian 
or, or whether you're earth-based culture, the idea that this body that we have is simply a vessel for this energy, this kind of cosmic energy that cannot be contained. And I don't believe it can be contained. I think that we are, you know, we're, we're made of star power, you know, well, you know, the same thing that drives the sun is driving us. And the idea that all these thoughts and all our love and pain and passion that we have, that it somehow goes away whenever this human body rots away, it makes no empirical sense to me whatsoever. Uh, there's so much to us as human beings, you know, as Hamlet said, you know, mankind is just a little less than angels. And I do believe that firmly. I, I think that we are, the reason why we're having this talk right now, my friend, the reason why we're talking about these things is because we can think outside of who we are right now, right? We're the only yeah. animal that can do that. And because we can think and rationalize outside of that, that is what gives me the idea that we are immortal, that we, we, there, we have no, per, you know, we're, you know, we are marvelous, marvelously immortal, I guess I should say. Um, but um, yes, I, so I, I don't think that, that death is ever the end. And I don't think that very few, very few cultures around the world see it that way as well, too. Yeah. I mean, there are, I, I cannot think of anyone as a matter of fact, um, you know, this is very interesting, too. Um, one of the first graves that was ever dug that we have found in the archaeological record that was left with grave goods, thinking that the person would live beyond this life, um, was actually a Neanderthal grave. So this oh, wow. idea, yeah, this idea that life goes on after we die is not only part of our humanness, it's part of that humanness of all these other people that live there as well, too. The ones that even, you know, didn't make it as part of the uh, uh, the evolutionary chain of being. But yes, that is one thing I can say, rest assured, that we do go on. I, I, I would agree. I would agree. I, 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 I appreciate your time. You know, I think we had a oh. good, really good hour. I think this was so interesting. I think the fans are really going to like it. And if you just want to tell people if you have any other speaking events or coming up oh. or uh, your website or b how to get sure. your books, all that stuff. Sure. Well, you can get my books on Amazon. Um, but because uh, hopefully a lot of your listeners would want to check out the Kecksburg. And I hope you're going to be there too, Robert. The Kecksburg. UFO conference, and it's going to be talking about cryptids as well too. When is that? Be, I didn't know about that. Yes, the last Thursday, the last Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this month. So we're only weeks away in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. Stan Gordon will be talking. Uh, Eric Altman will be talking. I'll be there. If you want to come out and get my books, I always have specials on my book prices uh, whenever I'm at conferences. So I hope you guys come on out, and I hope I get a chance to meet you in person, Robert. Yeah, that, I'd love to. I didn't know that was going on. I, I knew the Mothman Festival was coming up, but I, yeah. I'll i have to try to make it to that. I, I mean, I know I work on Fridays, but I could probably at least try to come on Saturday one day because I know I'm off on Saturdays. Yeah. So yeah. I can and it's also on Sunday as well, too. The speakers are on Sunday. And the good thing about this is um, free parking. Uh, it's free to get into. Uh, it's right outside of Mount Pleasant, so it's an easy enough uh, venue to get to. It's really one of my favorite events. Oh wow! Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna. Um, I'm gonna get with some people and see if they want to get together and and go on go, and and the uh, people that subscribe to my channel that are from this area. You know. What yes. I mean? Oh yeah, make a road trip. Yeah, yeah, that's what we did. Uh, me and a, a girl did for the um. That's a she's a subscriber to my channel. That's what we did for the Butler UFO conference. I'd like right. to do something similar for this. I think that would be fun. Like you know. Um. Oh. So, yeah. Thank you, Ron. This is awesome. This is uh, this is amazing. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure, Robert. Anytime, I, I would love to be on your show again. Uh, I, I'm very honored that you asked me to come on again. And uh, yeah, and I hope to see you down at uh, down at Kecksburg. Okay, definitely. I'll try to make it. All right, my friend. We'll talk to you soon. All right, have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.